however they want to look at it. So these three would be, would determine for you the three scenarios that you would model before the next meeting? Well, there's going to be four, and there will be four, there will be four sample, at least four sample scenarios where we're putting 100% on each one and showing the divergence in the portfolios that each one of the, you know, putting that much weight on each one suggests. And they're very different. So and, we'll and see the results before we're taking yes, action, yes, yes, voting yes, our yes, 10 and, points. Yes. And Paul, right. in the most simplistic way, but it really is the most accurate way, you have a risky, which are the green ones, and you have a risk avoidance one, which are the red ones. And it, it doesn't need to be, these are just measures of more risk or less risk. And then we'll show you what the impact of less risk or more risk is. And it really, you could change the names of these or the definitions, but in risk return space, you'd end up in the same place, plus or minus. The, the portfolio might end up looking different, but the role of the assets and how they form in a portfolio wouldn't change at all. And, and given that these are, again, just tell me what your assumption is going to be about funding since all of these all of these are measured with respect to funded status well funding implying what the contribution support yes. you're going to get yes. from the state will want we'll do it under two scenarios for you okay. we'll do it under status quo and we'll do it under we've talked about this before but under option 1 30 year funding you get your four, your 4 and a half to 5 billion dollars of contributions we'll we'll do those Someday. Some day, well, whatever whatever option one, one assumes, we'll make some assumptions on that and say, here it is. And we'll run those four separate options. And if um, later in the process, the, you, the world changes, and all of a sudden there's a two or a three or a four, the model's built. You just change that number and you rerun the model. It's a tool. It's a tool to help you make decisions, and it's a tool that will be changed in three or four years with new and better information at that time. And, and I'll just guess, under both scenarios, you put 100% weight on the two red ones, you're going to get very similar portfolios regardless of the scenario. You're just scared, so you're just run, you're fleeing. But depending on that contribution support, that'll be, that'll that might change the portfolio under the two green items. And if you get the contribution support, you might choose to take more risk because that's what it will show you. repeat it back to you to make sure I understand it. So we basically are going to get kind of a total of eight different scenarios. These are kind of, two. Um, well, two, two with four different set of criteria, right? So you're going to look at one scenario assuming status quo relative to funding, another scenario assuming that you're going to have whatever assumptions uh, we make about what funding changes would be. And then for those, we're going to look at them in terms of what are the numbers based on how we look at these different criteria or these different decision factors. And with that, we can have a sense of, um, and we and, and is one of the things that we're going to know is how the how the different scenarios relative to um, under the scenario that's based on current uh, on status quo, how it ties to what our current portfolio and what no changes would continue to mean. Yeah, this is all relative to current policy. Got it. So, yeah. so we're going to know kind of if we don't change anything, what's the world going to look like? And these are four different criteria for how we're going to look at the information. And we're going to have kind of eight total yeah. different Yeah, scenarios. plenty all of right. information. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. All right. It's a great, it's a cool exercise. So I just want to, so with that, do you have enough information to move forward? If you insert this, we know what to do. Say again? If you don't, oh, if sorry. You, if you, as the chair, told us that you're comfortable with that, we're comfortable with that. Okay. And Let's we will start board. working on that. Okay. So I, I, what I hear the board directing you to do is to, to move forward with creating I, I think it would be helpful to adopt the four. Uh, yeah, decision factors. That's, that's what we're looking for, but, to adopt the four decision factors. But we have a... Can I... <laughs> sorry, Paul. Excuse me if I'm really getting in. Uh, getting much, getting hang on, Paul. Hang on. You're not in. Go ahead. These are... These are... are Portfolio. You're, we're defining four portfolio objectives, and you are now going to optimize four different portfolios, each of which seeks these four objectives, right? Right. Okay. Initially, so, not, we didn't say four. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, why don't you give the depth behind that? Yeah. And I was going to say, you don't have to adopt these. What you could do is at least direct staff to use these in the modeling for June. Okay. So you have something we can use in the computers. So let's let's no, take I, an example. I, let's take an example. We'll have, let's say the, the funding scenario, we have a model up there. It's interactive. It has four decision factors that you can weight with a total of 10 points. And those are the ones we're going to be voting with. And, and what we will say is, oh, look what happens if we weight decision number, decision factor one with full, all 10 points, we don't care about the other ones. Well, it'll search through the thousands and thousands of portfolios and it'll find the best one and it'll show you the result of that in terms of return, standard deviation return, all that relative to your current portfolio. And it'll do it within about one and a half seconds. Then we'll say, oh, now what if we change the weight and we go to all of our weight on a really conservative factor. Look how the selected portfolio changes based on a purely defensive posture. Look how that relates to the current portfolio. And then you will jointly, individually and collectively, weight those decision <laughs> factors. And we'll come up with some intermediate portfolio that will be not as extreme as the other ones we've been playing with, just to show you how it acts but it'll be compared with the current portfolio and you'll be able to see what it would mean. So you're setting your own, you're optimizing to your own balance of risk and reward. Have I made it worse? No, I just... I mean, I just know how I'm gonna, because I, I, these still don't make any sense to me. I'm just gonna, I'll just choose the, 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 the allocation of the 10 points to get to what I wanna get to, irregardless of what these four descriptors say. What do you want to get to, though? I mean, what do you want to do? What, I, I, what? I don't know. That's what I want to see. I want to see the range of options of return, upside risk, downside risk. But, and, and, this, and this will give you the, new, the numbers you're looking for to make that decision. This is just a tool to get us okay. to do the modeling to give you the numbers. Okay. Because at the end of the day, Paul, you're going to make a decision based upon the numbers, the way you're thinking of them, in the way we've discussed them, not in some abstract way, but right. very concretely, here's the portfolio, here's its expected return. So whatever, whatever factors allow you to run a whole bunch of scenarios, <laughs> that's it. fine with me. That's okay. it. <laughs> and I would add, Is that emotional? Dana picked up a good thing. Dana and Terry are the only two of you that have been through this. The other value is you get to see how your other board members feel, and then you get to argue amongst each other and, and learn from each other of, you know, well, this is what I really care about. Well, this is what I, and that's where, in a nutshell, we are finding your appetite for risk and then the best portfolio that will achieve that. And it's not just one person's, but it's each individual collective. board member's also is a collective. I would like to move the four factors to be used in the modeling. Uh, if I well, may. Let, let, let her, she's made a motion, so. And, and I'm sorry, but you know, we're, we're hearing from investments. I think you also need to hear the general counsel's point of view. Uh, the, the discussion has been uh, very robust. It's been um, back and forth. There's been a lot put on the table. There's a lot of, been a lot of talking and, and discussion of the various factors. Um, I don't know if our audience is completely clear on what it is that uh, folks in front of you are asking you to 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 do to vote on. Um, I don't not necessarily sure why you would have to have a motion rather than just instruct them what to do. So, all right, but you're the board. You don't have to take action. I'm, just, get I'm trying to move us forward. I know, and, right? I, and, <laughs> and I do appreciate. It. That's why I wanted to jump in and say, you, know, you can you can do whatever you want. It's just that there was a lot of discussion, a lot of things brought up. And if you just instruct the staff what you want them to do in order to, to go through the next step, as far as your lawyer, I think that's sufficient. So you then, then, then let me ask. The chair would, as a consensus matter, that's right. Right. say, do we think, yes. So even though it's an action item, we can just say, we're not, we're, we're giving, we gave instruction, you know what to do. And so okay, we can then just I'm good. do that. I'm we good. do have one person online, so Rich, we're winding down now. So, okay, perfect. One of the questions okay. I had asked, which was, 
if we somehow adopt these, are we somehow bound by these things? Yeah, that's, that's because I, because I still don't know what they mean. But I, I mean, and, and it, the answer is if you understand what they mean so that you can come up with our scenarios, I'm fine with that. We're going to actually ask to put our finger on the risk o meter, right? Okay? And I'm assuming that I'm a little higher risk than Paul, but I'm not certain about it, right? It, 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 so as long as we sort of understand, as long as I guess, I understand that that's what we're going to do in the next section, right? If this has meaning for you in putting that together, I'm okay with that. Because I, just so long as I'm sort of understanding what the at the end of the day the exercise is going to be. Because I don't, I still can't get the relationship between this wording and that, and that exercise. I think, that will, I think, I think everyone is aware now. Yeah, I think I our staff and our consultants bound by anything by are aware we're not board. bound by anything, but that there's cl clearly there's lack of clarity on this board. So you will provide that clarity, provide the scenarios that we've requested, and we look forward to the next conversation in June. And let's go have lunch. Chris, so we've got item 13, our consideration of investment decisions. So I'll shout, uh, item 13, um, first off. Uh, Guys, can we have it quiet and Randy Diamond. I don't know who has the projector. Randy voice. Diamond on the phone. Randy, we're starting up again. Please oh, It's the repair. Pension investment age. I have to call in the article. Um, Item 13, uh, I first off want to uh, thank uh, uh, two very awesome up-and-coming uh, investment officers, and I didn't ask them to come down here, so I don't know if they're here. Uh, but uh, Philip LaRue, I know, is here, and he was going to come forward in case you had questions. And then Arinthio, did he come down? Rats. He's upstairs, but a shout-out to Arinthio uh, in the uh, Global Equity staff, another uh, great up-and-coming. Go ahead, Philip. Um, for their help in uh, coordinating this item and putting it together. Um, so in a nutshell, um, we first, uh, as you know, tried to engage. The companies, uh, frankly, initially said they would try and meet with us uh, as we were coordinating dates, and suddenly their lawyers called back and said they would not meet with us. Um, so that was, uh, I didn't make the lawyer comment. Where's Brian? He, Brian always has a thousand lawyer jokes. There you go. Um, so, the uh, first determination was whether or not this violated uh, our risk factor. We now have an ESG uh, 21 risk factor committee among the staff comprised of all the different asset classes. Uh, Phil presented the risk uh, that uh, these uh, guns in particular play to human health, uh, and we made the vote and decision that they did violate uh, t that risk factor. Um, so then, as uh, Ian has outlined, that leaves you with two questions about whether it's prudent to uh, div uh, um, to divest um, or whether it's uh, imprudent. Is it not imprudent to divest? Um, as we pointed out, uh, surprisingly, uh, these stocks have performed better than the market over the last 10-year period. Um, we outlined some of the uh, information uh, on these companies and why people perceive they have done so well. Our equity managers have been in and out of these stocks at different levels and at different times. Uh, right now, our exposure is just in the passive indices, but our active managers did buy these stocks from time to time. Uh, after an analysis uh, with the global equity staff about the impact, uh, I determined it would not be, in my judgment, uh, it would not be imprudent to divest from these stocks. Um, considering everything, the everything being equal test, and I know Ian Lanoff presented that to you yesterday, how that test is even changing slightly. Um, these stocks are de minimis to our portfolio. Uh, in keeping with the comment I made to the legislative committee yesterday, I would still say, I'm, I, while I can say they are de minimis, we are worried about how often we can say de minimis before a straw breaks the camel's back. How many things are too small? We do have a very large diversified portfolio, but that diversity comes from a number of holdings. Uh, in your packet, uh, PCA evaluated uh, my recommendation, and they concur and support it um, uh, to divest of uh, these two stocks. Um, and also, um, uh, to uh, monitor going forward, we're hiring a third-party service that will monitor companies uh, and products. As we've said, the California 
uh, prohibition is to certain features. So when those features are present, uh, we'll also have to monitor it going forward. Because if one of these companies was sold, say, to a larger, I'm going to say a military uh, manufacturer, military supplier, uh, Lockheed or Boeing or somebody, uh, then we'd have to evaluate whether these would still be considered uh, uh, de minimis to the portfolio. So with that, you have my recommendation, which is based on all the information in the packet and the research that we have done. Uh, my recommendation is for you to uh, divest of uh, uh, firearms that are banned under the state of California law. And ammunition, right? And ammunition? Or just firearms? And the high capacity ammunition magazines. Great. Okay. I just wanted to add for the record that um, I'm very pleased that the process that you established has been followed in this um, in this situation, and you know based on you know what you're being told and the information, the amount of work that was performed by your experts on this issue, um, I'm comfortable telling you that you know you were you would be prudent or you have a basis for uh, agreeing with the recommendation. Yeah. Chris, you you talked a little bit about um, the foregoing <laughs> basis where we might find ourselves uh, in a situation where a company that we do own has picked up some of these and that, that we'd have to take another look back at it. Um, we will also be doing doing our due diligence process of investing in a company to see if they have these holdings also correct yes this would be similar to tobacco when we divest of, of anything we put out a restricted list so that managers are aware they may not purchase anything we would also provide this to our private equity managers and and real estate if it came into play but w we cannot force uh the private equity firms particularly the partnerships we've already been in um, if they wanted to, but they would be aware of our intentions and desire not to be, and, and I think that would factor in very heavily in their decision-making. And then a, a follow-up. Um, I guess I was just as surprised to see that um, these manufacturers or the sectors doing fairly well. Um, it kind of goes with what I know anecdotally, at least in my area, that the more the gun control debate heats up, the more weapons that are bought, the more ammunition that is stored. Um, but I guess it would be a guessing game or speculation into what type of success that they would have after stricter gun control goes through. Was there any speculation um, on your part as you and um, Research well, we, this, so what those returns would be if strict gun control was passed? Yeah, that's what we tried to look at, was to look to the past, to where gun control has been brought up or restricted in certain states, and then uh, what happened to those companies going forward. Because both of these companies are really uh, one product uh, type companies. They're not diversified. One bought a, a bow and arrow company, but that's about the extent of their diversification. Um, the, the, it is too difficult for us uh, to tell at this point where the federal legislation is going. Obviously, some stuff has just broken yesterday and, and maybe even today on it, but it is still not in law, and so it's difficult to say the impact. Um, that legislation seems to be focused on uh, either particular features or just the registration process. Um, and in past, that has not um, dramatically hurt the companies. What we looked at was the long-term performance over 10 years, uh, which has had various gun control debates. Thank you. Pam. Um, on behalf of the treasurer, Chris, we'd like to thank you and your staff for all the work that you've done Great. on on this uh, matter. And I would also like to make a motion to divest in the gun <coughs> manufacturers that um, produce weapons and the high capacity magazines that are legal or illegal for sale or possession by uh, people in California. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Any abstentions? Passes. Oh, I wanted to read a, just a brief statement um, because this is a significant decision that the board is making and that our, our vote today um, to divest from companies that manufacture firearms and large capacity magazines uh, is the right decision for our fund and our members. This board represents California educators and their families. As a board, we have a duty to our membership to balance financial returns with social responsibility. And our actions should uphold the values of this fund's members and the policies by which we hold ourselves accountable. Although prompted by devastating events, our decision today renews our focus on environmental, social, and governance issues and the importance of responsible investing. As educators, we set a course for success based on critical thinking and the ability to make appropriate choices for one's future. We stress the importance of research, preparedness, and sound judgment. Uh, today, I'm proud of the decision that we're making here. Uh, as a board, we have in place mechanisms that allow us to make prudent investment decisions. For more than 20 years, this fund has championed responsible investments. We're one of only a few large public institutional investors that have a policy on divestment. And having the 21 risk factors firmly in place positions us to take appropriate action on relevant global and national issues. Our attention to these factors separate us from other financial organizations where narrow short-term indicators drive decisions regardless of the long-term ramifications. At the same time, CalSER celebrates its centennial anniversary. We've taken the opportunity to set a standard for the next 100 years, a standard where the quality of our investment is based on its contribution to the future as well as its present value. So thank you and job board. All right, thank on you. to the next item. Uh, item 14, back to Alan. Come on. I'm giving some exercise today, Alan. You're not in church. <laughs> I was going to say, you've been here before. <coughs> Madam Chair, members, uh, Alan Emkin, PCA. This is the general consultant semi-annual report for the period ending 12-31-12. I will go through this relatively quickly, but I have a couple of important things to highlight. First, the wonderful news, the portfolio had a return of 13.5% last year, significantly ahead of the actual interest rate assumption. And uh, that's something that will help the financial condition of the plan. On page two, there is a table, and the table compares the portfolio with its policy benchmark. Uh, as good as the return of the portfolio was, it significantly underperformed its benchmark. Uh, all of that variance and more is the result of the problems associated with having a benchmark for private markets, which are tied to public markets. And uh, the private equity consultant, or in fact, the real estate consultant, could address the fact that these things don't foot. And as a result, uh, that is the big factor in the one year. Um, the other big poor performance relative to the benchmark is the five year. And most of that is attributable to the poor performance of real estate in the crash. On pages three and four are the PCA risk metrics. They pretty much speak for themselves, but the key takeaway is that the markets continue uh, to, the equity market continues to have low expected volatility. Uh, the risk the biggest risk we see is interest rate risk. And that's been the same every time I've come to you now for, I think, six quarters or eight quarters. And that's because the federal policymakers continue to keep interest rates at historical lows, which means that the interest rate sensitivity of the portfolio is at historical highs. So if, not when, but if, no, excuse me, when, not if, uh, the Federal Reserve modifies its policy even at the margin, 
interest rates will rise and that high sensitivity to interest rate variation will impact the bond market. On page 17, we talk about some of the economic factors that impact the portfolio. Uh, growth is back, but it's moderating. Inflation is modest, but we believe it is increasing. And although unemployment Keep going. You're fine. has shrunk or been reduced, uh, that's a deceptive number because there's a significant undercount based upon the way that people calculate unemployment. But just anecdotally, walking in my neighborhood, uh, houses that had been vacated are being remodeled. Uh, people are selling single family homes. And so there is lots of indication that there is definitely some positive news in the economy and, and that's a good thing. Uh, we believe that's driven in no small part by historically low interest rates. On page 19, just a brief summary of some of the statistics about the domestic equity market. Uh, the one I would point to is the top table. It shows the one-year returns, amongst other things, for the various sectors of the US equity market. And the best performer was the financial sector. Uh, that, represents uh, over 16 to 17% of the equity market. It was the best performer, and it's because interest rates were so low, uh, they benefited by that, by a, being in the spread business. The wonderful news is even net of negative cash flows, the portfolio has $14 more billion in the portfolio today than it did at the beginning of the year. And I don't care how you measure these things, that's a really good thing. Uh, the, the challenge now is uh, keeping it. The uh, next thing I'd want to point out, and just in passing on page 24, is the investment performance of each of the various sectors of the portfolio, uh, equity, domestic equity, private markets, fixed income, et cetera. And I just want to point out that over all periods, uh, the US equity portfolio uh, has not done significantly better in most cases. It's lagged its benchmark. And that that is an asset class that, in fact, could be managed passively at much lower cost. And that's something your staff and we will be bringing back to you uh, for your consideration later in the year. There's only one manager I wanted to bring to your attention on a domestic equity side, and that's relational investors. Uh, they've underperformed. Uh, there's some good reasons why they underperformed, but we'll continue to monitor that very closely. Uh, in the first quarter, which I just got that information today, they bounced back significantly and had a really good quarter. Uh, but there's lots going on at Relational. The bond managers and the bond portfolios internally and externally did exactly what you would hope they would do. Uh, but I'm just going to urge you, as you look at these reports in coming months and years, not to expect the kinds of returns you've had from fixed income in the previous 30 years uh, in the next 30 years. Because those of you who remember, when I started in this business in the late 70s, early 80s, the long treasury bond was trading in the 15, 16% range. You got 1% a month in your Merrill Lynch cash management account. Well, now you don't get 1% a year in your Merrill Lynch cash management account. You get 35 or 40 basis points if you're lucky. And we live in a different world and bonds are not like stocks. Stocks can grow infinitely with earnings. Bonds can't. They can only go up in value if interest rates fall, and it's hard to see how interest rates could fall very much from where they currently are. And lastly, I just want to close with 
just putting a comparison for you with other pension plans, and I'll only refer to the universe of public funds, and it's all public funds, large and small. Over the long term, you're in the top third, but over five years, you're at the 97th percentile. That's driven by the poor relative performance of real estate. Uh, but over closer periods, one in three years, you're well into the top half, and uh, you and your staff deserve credit for that. And over time, that five-year number will improve as real estate debacle uh, begins to uh, go away. And be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Thank you, Alex. All right, Michael N. Our real estate semiannual performance reports. Hi, Michael. <clears throat> Michael McGee with the Townsend Group. We will be reviewing your uh, performance uh, as of the third quarter of 2012. And I'm going to start you on INV 464. You will notice, hopefully, because I'm sure you've studied intently on the previous reports, that we have a whole new format this quarter. Um, this reflects the additional information we've been able to obtain through Private Edge's new changes to their system. Uh, it gives us a deeper look into the portfolio and really allows us to give you a better sense of what's going on in the real estate program, what you can expect on a going forward basis. So if you have comments or special requests or things that don't make sense to you, um, additional pieces of information you'd like to see if we can get more information on, I would be happy to do, do so. And you can get my contact information through Chris if you don't have it already. Uh, in summary, uh, for, the, for the quarter, at the end of the third quarter, your portfolio was funded at a 14.2% exposure to real estate. That's about $3.5 billion and um, above the 12% target that you have for real estate. You do have an allowable range, and that range, uh, we are within the range. And we uh, remind you that we have been making limited investments. Uh, culling the portfolio continues over uh, the last few months, and last few years, I mean. And um, we expect that we'll stay within that range uh, for, for the foreseeable future and certainly uh, at or above the target if, if we can continue to do so. Uh, your uh, near-term returns demonstrate a recovery in your portfolio uh, during the market uh, decline. Your portfolio declined 33.4%. Since that time, it has increased in value 83.8%. Um, earlier, we were asked a question during the closed session, I'm happy, which I would like to address in open session as well, and that is that 22% improvement, where does it come from? Uh, you had, in the last year, uh, you've had $3.3 .3 billion in allocations. 75% of that was made into the core sector, so you are having a significant increase towards that portfolio targets we've adopted. Uh, you had about a billion in sales. The most of those came from your core sector as well, because while we're making new core investments, 14 of the 24 investments that were sold were sold from that core sector. And you remember staff's uh, video clip talked about the fact that multifamily has been um, putting some assets onto the market so that we can realize some gains in a very frothy uh, asset cycle for that particular property type. Uh, from a performance perspective, you have outperformed your benchmark or over the shorter term uh, for the quarter and the one-year time period. Our projections for your portfolio is that that outperformance or at least relative performance should continue can't really predict as easily what the benchmarks will do, um, but we expect that the recovery in your portfolio and the realization of gains as well as good, strong performance going forward will continue. Uh, you do underperform your benchmark over the longer periods. Uh, the, in the three to five year period, those do tend to still include some of those vintage year investments and heavy weighting towards those particular vintage year investments. The next page uh, just reflects the funding status and compliance with your strategic plan. The two squares that are highlighted in red are the two areas of your portfolio that are not in compliance with the targets. Uh, again, remind you that the 2010 strategic plan targets a 50, 20, 30 
50% core, 20% value, 30% opportunistic. Um, but it also envisions that that recomposition of your portfolio will take some time to get to get to from where we were at 2010 when the, that portfolio was adopted. From a return perspective, uh, your total portfolio, these are time-weighted returns on for the third quarter, one year, three, five, and 10 year. Uh, you can see that your more recent periods are doing well against, and we have, a ver we have various indices here. We have the CalSTRS real estate benchmark, which is a blend of your historical benchmark and then starting in the second quarter of 2012 using the new Odyssey benchmark that was adopted with that new strategic plan. Uh, and then we have the Odyssey itself, which is basically your new, core, your new portfolio benchmark, as well as your old benchmark, which is the NPI, uh, just for comparison purposes for you to see how you are relative to the old and, and to what you've adopted. And you can see that there's not in the short term, not much variance between those three indices. It really is over the longer term that you see some variance between the performance. Uh, <clears throat> most important thing here is that we're very happy with that short-term performance. And even over the three-year, the 8% target would be achieving an objective that if you move with your asset allocation assumptions discussed earlier, would be achieving the asset allocation needs of your portfolio on a, a net basis relative to the, to the market or close to it, I guess, if we're eight and a half. This is your time-weighted returns by strategy. This gets a little busy, uh, and hopefully so in, in front of you, you can see it a little bit easier. I have myself have to put my glasses on. Um, the first column being your core net, uh, second one, your value, and third, opportunistic. Uh, and those are measured against the particular benchmarks. And, and really, this while we're showing the individual strategies, what we're trying to show you here is that you can see the volatility in those opportunistic uh, returns as well as in the core, in particular, you can see it in your public markets. I'll just point out to you that your public markets are only about 2 to 3% of your total portfolio. So despite that nice big bar of 56.3%, it doesn't do much for your total return. Um, but we're, again, pleased that, to see the, the improving performance as we move forward. And with a 2.5 core, 4.2 in value, and 3.2 in opportunistic for the one quarter, those are all on one year uh, records for moving into being well uh, positioned to achieve the return objectives for each of those styles that we've established. This is um, a chart showing it's our first three-year period where we can show performance for you post-correction. So this takes the returns after the 08 write-downs and shows you what your portfolio has done on a going forward basis. Uh, the returns for core or for the third quarter are above all of your benchmarks, as are the one year. The three year portfolio re is below your benchmarks, but again, we'll remind you that that includes um, a lot of the J curve. Your one year return will, will not experience as much of the J curve of the investments made in 09 and 2010 or 2010 and 2011 uh, into your portfolio. Um, we talked a little bit earlier, but I will remind you that. These returns also reflect an effort to move you out of the opportunistic and into core. Uh, in 2010, you were 51% opportunistic, 19 value, and 30% core. Uh, and as of the fourth, the third quarter 2012, you were 46% opportunistic, 16% value, and 37% core. So your shift has been away from the higher returning and into the more stable assets. Uh, this just uh, addresses your um, geographic and property type diversification. We don't have any specific targets or restrictions for that diversification. We monitor it on a, as a piece of information and to give us some insights into where we might be attributing returns. Um, from our view of the world perspective, you can see that you you've have a, a good exposure to the uh, core multifamily. And, and we only look at this with respect to your core portfolio because in the non-core areas, it really doesn't, it's not about the property type as much as it is the particular opportunity. So we've segregated out the core here. Um, that overexposure, that strong exposure to apartments has helped your core portfolio. Uh, the underexposure to office, we think, has helped you to this date, but you might be seeing that increase a little bit as you go forward because the belief is that office is the next recovering property type. And the industrial assets, always a long-term stable bet. So that position there also keeps you healthy relative to your, uh, your benchmark exposure. 
Retail is uh, is down, uh, and it is an asset type that's coming back into favor, so we'll, we'll likely be seeing your staff get some retail opportunities put in front of them, uh, and the rest of them are just other and hotel, which have smaller impacts on your portfolio. The new report allows us to take a deeper dive into your portfolio, and uh, what you see here is the top seven managers who represent 77% of your portfolio. I'm using this information at this stage because I think it's really insightful, but I really want you to focus on the quarter and the one-year period because one of the challenges in how we're, this, this is being gathered and reported by uh, Private Edge is that that five-year number, those managers might not be in the top 7%, top seven managers in your, your uh, portfolio. They may have been larger, they may have been smaller. Those positions change over time. Um, Private Edge does not, uh, historically has not gathered what we refer to as average invested capital. So you can take the average amount that over a five year period. Uh, they are working on gathering that for us. And when they do that, then we'll be able to show you the impact of a particular manager in your portfolio over an extended period of time. Can I just, can you explain that one more? I didn't totally catch that, but yeah. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. What we look, we do, we're we're looking here yeah. at the manager's market value as of 930. Okay. And the reality is that their market values five years ago were going were, could be very significantly different, right. and they might you might not look at the top at these seven managers might not be the same firms five years ago as they are when oh. you look at them for the one quarter, and the one year return. Oh, so okay. on a one year and one quarter, the good news is your top seven managers by market value are all beating your objectives. Mm -hmm. They're all that those are green squares. Those are people that are exceed on the three and the five year term. Those particular seven managers, and one of them doesn't even have a three-year period for performance, um, are underperforming the objective. But it's hard to say whether they were the biggest seven managers in your portfolio because we don't have that data point. Well, Private Edge is working on gathering that data point, and we'll use that on a going-forward basis once they've collected that. And that'll give us a better sense of which managers are contributing and which managers aren't. So this, and it, this is just for the core portfolio. Uh, this is the same information for your value portfolio, the same caveats applied. This is um, 10 managers represent 89% uh, 80, of your total value exposure. And so they do control, and you can see that even on a three-year basis, the, the, the aggregate of these, three, these uh, 10 managers is above your benchmark. The value portfolio, is, its performance is really dominated by its vintage year exposure. Your managers, and we'll look at that a little bit deeper, uh, actually, I think, down in the next slide. Your managers in the 02, 04, 05, was mostly in the 02, 04, when you look at to the, to the far right of this table, those are the Nacreef Townsend fund level indices. So it represents all of the funds that report to that index who had an inception period for those vintage years listed on the left. And we are comparing your vintage year investments to those same indices. So if you made an investment in 2002, its current market value is now 574 aggregate. The net IRR of all of those 2002 investments is a negative 4.9. And to the right are the various quartiles for those, those, those vintage peers. What we use these types, this type of an analysis to see is manager selection. So in general, what this slide tells us is that we didn't do a great job in picking managers in each of those vintage years. Some of the year, the earlier years, it's the answer is more absolute than in the current periods. So for instance, in 2002, you would likely have had a full liquidation by 2012, but managers definitely got caught up in the 2008. When you look at those uh, 2008 market, when you look at the median and top quartile managers, we went in and looked at the different participants. And what we can tell you is that the higher performing managers are those that had invested from 2002 quickly and divested, and so they missed 2008. You can't catch up with those quartiles if your managers didn't liquidate. You still have capital invested in those vintage years, and so it's just dilutive as you hold it longer, and it dilutes your IRR. The more uh, current vintage years, 05, 06, 07, uh, just reflect the market crisis, and it's really still very early for many of those to even be judging the performance of your particular managers. A lot of the resulting performance will really depend on those managers who were patient and didn't necessarily invest all of their capital in 06 and 07 and had a good amount of capital to still invest in 09 and in 2010. I have a question from Dana. 
So Michael, and just looking through these quickly as you're going through. Um, so it looks like CB Richard Ellis and the core, not good. Um, and the value added, not good. Um, you concerned about us continuing to be in business with Richard Ellis? Yeah, you know, it, it, it certainly jumped out at us, um, but quite candidly, this is the first time we've been able to get this information, so that's a conversation we'll be having with staff as, on these managers. But we also want to look at the average invested capital and what is, you know, and what the mandates are. Um, we need to look more into the portfolios, but yes, it, it, this, the idea is for this to highlight those things that we should be discussing, and we will be doing that. Uh, this is uh, a chart for your opportunistic managers. Uh, these top 16 managers represent about 74% of your portfolio. Good news for the opportunistic portfolio is that at least for the first qu the, for the, the quarter, you're beginning to outperform your uh, targeted returns. Um, we would look for that to continue as the market recovery continues and bolsters up those returns. Uh, the performance of um, the portfolio uh, has been up until this last quarter, really um, well below target and well below expectation, but that is beginning to turn the corner, and uh, that should help to make it more accretive to your 8% or 9% target that you have for real estate. And have. This is the detail on the vintage year analysis. Uh, again, very determined, the, the, alloc the performance very determined by the year in which you invested in it. You can see that your most of your 2002, 2003 managers have liquidated, um, but you're very heavily exposed to 05, 06, 07, and those are poor performing vintage years. Um, and uh, we'll still early to judge whether at the end of the day they will perform for you relative to the, to the marketplace. One of the challenges for real estate is that until it's fully liquidated, we can't get to the real hard of what's going on with each of these funds. Some managers mark to market, some of them don't. Some of them have 50% realized, some of them have 10%, some of them have 80%. So while it is all a vintage year comparison, it is not necessarily apples to apples until we really have a full liquidation of the manager and compare them to what they said they were gonna do, the performance that they achieved. Um, the other thing that I do want to point out to you, and it's very obvious in this chart, if the bottom quartile for uh, the IRRs is a negative 6.2 and you are a negative 12.1, how does that happen? And one of the things about these indices, while they are insightful and they give us things to dig into, they are hampered by the fact that they are success biased. The, ma the worst managers don't want to report to the indices, and the best ones all report. So they do tend to be success bias, and, and until we get full liquidation of the funds, it's very difficult for us to get to the real information. But again, all we're trying to do is get a little more insight into what's determining the performance and how we can describe and change things going forward to ensure that you start to meet your return objectives. Uh, this is just a, a quick sl um, slide on the public. You're, again, we haven't ever really made a, a big entree into the public markets. You don't have any uh, dedicated REIT managers or public security REIT managers. Your securities have come through other investments and are, uh, again, less than 2 to 3% of your total portfolio. So while the numbers are nice, they don't have much of an impact on the total plan. Um, that was all I was going to go through since I know you are a little time concerned. I'm happy to take you through view of the world, but I tried to touch on that with the property types. Um, also, from some of our discussions, uh, with closed session board meetings um, last year and this year. We did discuss the view of the world and Townsend's use of that for on behalf of this board. It is being re-verified, um, I guess is the way, so we do it twice a year. Uh, by the end of April, we should have a new uh, publication of that view of the world. And I hope to have a number of sessions with each of you, either in small groups or individually, where we can walk you through that view of the world so that when we're sitting in front of you, you can have some context on, on the investments that are being made in the position of the portfolio. So that would be it. I can answer any questions you have. You're suggesting that we could we can do that in another uh, upcoming board meeting or what? 
I guess I'm wondering. I have to work with your legal counsel on how you not violate Brown Act because you can't have con consecutive meetings and all the different different right. things. Right. Um, we can do it. You know, there are a number of different ways we can do it. Um, each of you individually can call me and just ask questions about the materials that we've been sent out, and we'll I'll work with your with your staff and with your board. Um, but the idea is to get it in front of you without taking a good amount of time of your board meeting because you're jam packed every single time, and we tend to always pass that off. So um, we want to find a way to get that information to you, have you understand it, and be able to understand it when you have and have your context when you are making reviewing the, the portfolio and listening to what activity is being done in real estate. Okay. So we'll figure out how to do it legally. Okay. That's Sounds great. good. Thanks so much, Mike Lenz. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Item 16, Mike Moy, private equity. For the, rec <clears throat> for the record, Mike Moy from PCA. I'll go through this rather quickly. Uh, INV 553 has the performance against the benchmarks. You've heard a lot about private equity benchmarks and how they tend to distort reporting in terms of a public market being compared to a private market. I don't have a cure for that. Um, I, uh, the industry's been looking for one for years and still hasn't found one. Um, we are looking at the uh, idea of um, potentially going to a global benchmark for private equity, and we would come back to you with staff uh, for something that could be effective July 1st. So we'd have a cutoff that would tie to a fiscal year. The important thing, I think, to look at when you look at the private equity returns are the absolute amounts. Um, the, as you can see, with the exception of the five-year period, the absolute returns have been uh, pretty good. They've been in, in excess of most of the other asset classes, if not all of them, uh, and they've been contributing to the overall performance of the fund. Um, in terms of where the industry is, just quickly, uh, fundraising uh, in 2012, um, basically we had two marketplaces. We had the very good funds who didn't have any trouble raising money, and we had the not so very good funds, and they had a lot of trouble raising money. And I think that's a condition that's going to continue. So we'll, we will see a, um, a weeding out of managers who have not been performing well. The ones who are successful in fundraising will be the ones who've been performing better than the average bear. Um, what that means for your portfolio, since you are, have a portfolio that is uh, tilted towards the better end of the marketplace in terms of performers, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact on, on, on uh, your portfolio. It will have an impact, I think, on the marketplace because you'll have potentially less competition for transactions, which could have an impact on pricing. Um, if you go to INV 559, you will see that the, um, the private equity program for two, 2011 and year-to-date 2012, and actually for all of calendar 2012, was cash flow positive, so that the, the numbers that uh, were mentioned earlier about the um, amount of cash that has been generated by the, uh, the fund in total, a, a good piece of it uh, is coming from, from private equity. We would expect that to probably continue um, for the foreseeable future, but at some point in time, uh, capital calls will start to ratchet up uh, at least that's the thought. Um, and whether the realizations will continue at the, the rate and level that they've been experiencing over the past um, 12 to 18 months, I uh, just can't predict that. Um, if you flip forward to INV 563, you'll see a depiction of the performance of, of the partnerships versus co-investments. Uh, co-investments are... Um, sort of a hot topic now in the private equity industry. Um, many of managers and, and limited partners are using them as a way to deploy money in a very um, economic way because the manager offers to do co-investments with the limited partner and there's no fee, no carry. Um, 
but what it does expose the limited partner to is the potential for adverse selection because they will be offered co-investment opportunities in each portfolio company that a, a manager is considering adding to, the portf add, adding to their portfolios. Um, you can see here that the uh, return in, in, in one year for co-investments is, is approximated what it has been for the funds, but in the other periods presented, it, it has been less than uh, what's been uh, presented for the funds. So that is a risk you take on but the uh, improved economics should produce uh, higher rates of return on the co-investments and lower your overall cost of investing. Going to INV 567, um, the proactive portfolio, which I, I've mentioned every time we do the um, uh, semi-annual report, uh, you can see that we have uh, some funds who, who have outperformed and done a very good job, and we have many that have not done that. And I think that's a condition that you, it will continue, and staff has been monitoring it and will continue to be monitoring it. Uh, the last comment I have is, is more uh, goes to the marketplace again. We're seeing um, lots of capital available for transactions. We're seeing lots of capital being uh, collected by managers in, in recaps, dividend recaps. We're seeing purchase price multiples back up where they were in 2007, 2000, early 2008. We see a lot of conditions that are very similar to what was going on back just before the, uh, the financial crisis. So that causes uh, some concern because we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but it is something that the managers and staff are watching out for. Um, the thing you have to be concerned about is this is a good time to be selling, not necessarily buying. So managers have to be very selective in the transactions they pursue. Um, one of the prior uh, speakers indicated that he thought there was a trillion dollars of um, overhang that's going to be invested. I haven't seen the number that high. I've seen something three quarters of it. Um, I'm not sure that's going to really drive a lot of transactions. I think that there's a, there's a lot of opportunity out there, which managers are going to be going after. But whether they're going to be successful at getting them at the price they want to pay for them, or getting them in a way that they can do something with them, is going to be uh, it's going to be the $64 billion question that the industry and and the investors have to worry about. Um, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions people might have. Any questions from the board? No questions, Mike. Thank you. Good, thank you.